What's up Lazy Dog fam? Up everybody out there is having an awesome day. Got a special treat for you on today's video, something that I promised a few videos ago. So about a week, week and a half ago, I did a pretty lengthy interview with Jim Gerritsen of Wood Prairie Farms. They grow organic seed potatoes that folks like myself and you can grow in your backyard garden. Been knowing Jim uh, probably about eight or nine years and he's been growing potatoes for a long, long time and he knows everything there is to know about growing potatoes. Now Wood Prairie is an affiliate partner of Lazy Dog Farm and if you want to give some of their seed potatoes a try their website is woodprairie.com and you can use the code Lazy Dog Farm to get a 5% discount. Now I didn't really have any time requirements for this interview but once Jim and I started talking about taters it just kind of kept rolling and ended up going for almost two hours. So we split this up into two parts. We'll have the first part on this video and then the second part on the next video. So in this first part, Jim's going to talk about how his organic seed potatoes are produced and the importance of starting with a fresh, disease-free, certified batch of seed potatoes every time you plant. We're then going to get into some potato growing tips, like should you cut up your potatoes or should you plant whole potatoes, and Jim's going to talk about the specific size of potato seed piece that he has found that works best. He's also going to talk about this process called green sprouting, which I had never heard of before, that ensures your potatoes hit the ground running once you plant them. So make a pot of coffee, sit down and relax, and enjoy all this great information that Jim is about to share about seed potatoes and growing potatoes. You might even want a notepad so you can take a few notes along the way. I know I had to go back and watch it and write down a few things so I could apply them this next year. Now the video quality on this isn't as good as it is off this camera here because I was using the webcam on my computer, but nonetheless, a lot of great information and I hope you all enjoy it. All right, so we're here with Jim Gerritsen of Wood Prairie Farm, and happy to have Jim on the show. We've been growing potatoes a while, but Jim's the potato expert, and he's going to teach us a few things today. Jim, start out just by kind of introducing yourself a little bit, you know, where you're located, how long you've been doing this, how many acres you've got, all that good stuff. Okay, uh, Travis, good to talk with you. So we're up in northern Maine, uh, six miles from the Canadian border. And uh, we have a uh, farm in which we specialize in growing organic seed. And the main crop that we grow is uh, early generation Maine certified seed potatoes. And uh, our farm is about 120 acres and pretty common in Maine, uh, about half the acreage is in fields and half is in woodlot. Uh, so we grow, um, 24 different varieties of uh, Maine certified seed, all of it organically. And we've got customers in all 50 states. Uh, we've been doing this for almost 35 years uh, with a mail order business. And then uh, we began the uh, web store, I don't know, maybe 15 or 18 years ago. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, separates us from uh, our competition is because we grow our own seed potatoes and sell direct to customers. Uh, we have an on-farm underground potato storage and it allows us to ship basically uh, every week of the year. Um, we can ship 10 months a year uh, seed potatoes from the time we begin harvest in September uh through uh the month of july um so a lot of companies just um ship for uh, a month or a month and a half in the springtime but in our case we know that uh, we've got customers all over the country and some plant in the fall some plant in the early part of winter um, some plant uh, spring late spring so whenever uh our customers want to uh, seed we can send it to them so you said 35 acres total. Is that you plant 35 acres each year or you've got some that's resting and, and some that you're growing in? We've got uh, 60 acres total and we, we grow 10 or 12 acres a year of seed potatoes. And okay. we've got a four-year rotation. So three out of four years, we're building up the soil to go into that fourth year growing uh, seed potatoes. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's dig into a little bit about how seed potatoes are produced. There's a lot of people out there that think 
uh, the seed potato growers just tell you to buy new seed potatoes every year because they just want you to keep buying. But there's actually some value in having newer seed potatoes. We've seen this firsthand. I've got a, a generation or whatever you want to call them of red potatoes that I've been growing for three or four years. And it seems like the production declines a little bit each year. So tell me about how your potatoes are produced and, and why we see that decline in production year after year. Well, uh, every variety that we grow, we've got uh, three or four different generations. So uh, we start uh, with uh, disease-free tissue culture, and uh, we bring in potato plantlets that kind of look like alfalfa sprouts, and we, um, we grow them in uh, organic compost in a special screen house where rather than, it's like a greenhouse, rather than be covered by plastic, it's covered by aphid excluding netting. So we grow that out one year and the production from potato plantlets is called mini tubers. And the next year uh, we have a 600 foot long uh, tunnel, uh, portable tunnel that we plant in the soil, the mini tubers. <clears throat> and then what we harvest from that is called FY1 field year one. So that 600 foot long uh, screen house also has <clears throat> aphid excluding netting. And this is kind of hinting at what the problem is. Um, when you're growing potatoes outside, uh, aphids are the primary vector of potato virus. So <clears throat> the red potatoes that you've had, uh, you've got aphid activity. An aphid may have a potato disease in its system. They go on to feed onto a healthy plant. And uh, once they insert their probe, they've transferred that uh, potato virus into that plant and the tubers that you're going to harvest will have a uh, potato virus. So potato virus does nothing to harm human beings. It simply is some something that affects the potatoes. But if you look at a virus, uh, another kind of virus, how it would uh, slow down a human being, same idea with um, uh, potatoes. They're not able to grow as well. The tubers don't size up. And when you get loaded up with a lot of virus, um, your production uh, sinks dramatically. So it's for this reason <clears throat> that all commercial potato growers in, in the USA and Canada, they all plant certified seed every spring. And certified seed is um, something we have inspectors from the state come into our farm to check our crop for freedom from disease. And uh, when we, uh, pass all the requirements, we get these certified seed tags that we affix to the package. And it um, warrants that the seed that we've grown have met the uh, high standard of the Maine seed potato grade. So Maine started its uh, system over 100 years ago of certified seed. And the, the reason is that you get uh, the highest assurance that you're going to get a high quality crop from planting high quality seed. So uh, we do have some customers that will buy from us every other year. So in that way, they're no more than one generation away from certified seed. But, um, and we have some people that will buy from us um, seed potatoes for a spring crop, uh, plant say in February or March, and then harvest that crop in June, and then stick a portion of that crop in the back of the refrigerator for a couple of months and then to plant a fall crop, they take out the seed a couple of weeks before they want to plant, let it break dormancy, start sprouting, and they can grow a uh, fall crop, say in August, harvest sometime in November. Uh, in that way, they can grow an off-season uh, crop of potatoes twice a year, and then they'll come back to us and buy seed from us in the spring again, working on that principle of never being more than one generation away from uh, good, clean, certified seed. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we did this past year. We bought seed potatoes from you, planted them in February, had a few that we didn't eat, and then replanted them late August or so and grew out a fall crop. The, the fall crop for us never seems to be quite as productive as the spring crop. Not sure if that's weather related or related to the virus, you know, vectors that you mentioned, but it's worth doing, in my opinion, if you've got a few extra potatoes laying around and your, you know, your climate allows for yeah. it. 
Yeah, we have a friend uh, now retired, but he was an organic farmer in the Central Valley in California, and he would buy seed for planting in the spring and then again in the fall. And he told us that he he would have a better crop in the fall, uh, and he thought it was because you didn't have the crop in the spring. You have a crop coming into real hot weather around Fresno. Mm -hmm. um, and in the fall, it was cooled down. So he said he'd get a better quality crop, but with the caveat that occasionally he'd get a, an unseasonable frost that would kill his plants before the tubers had sized up. But he said when things went right, he, he would get a better crop in the fall. So it, it could be uh, the, the certified seed uh, issue. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, sometimes here we don't have a true spring and it just gets really hot really fast. You know, potatoes tend to decline pretty quick. And then this year I had to harvest my fall potatoes a little earlier than I wanted to, um, you know, but, you know, still some decent production there. It, it's always a little bit of a crapshoot down here. Um, so what, um, back to the, the virus vector thing. So you're saying even though the potato plants may look relatively healthy, there's viruses in them that are going to limit the production. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, some of the new uh, mutations of potato virus Y, which has been plaguing the industry now for you know 10 or 12 years, some of the uh, strains, like there's a necrotic strain, it is so basically it's symptomless. So you know historically we like other farmers we go through our fields on a weekly basis roguing out for virus and you know, these these new ones sometimes are so um, uh, subtle that you can't see it, that you can only test the leaves for virus or not. But uh, then there's also a possibility of late season aphid spread to where in the last weeks of growth, you may get infection, which doesn't give enough time for the leaves to express it, but it, it does go into the tubers and, and uh, impact. So for that reason, uh, the state of Maine invented this post-harvest test where they take a sample of potatoes from us representing every seed lot, um, and then they test those potatoes for freedom from disease. And in that way, they can identify if there was late season aphid spread that was not visible to the inspector or to the farmer. Gotcha. Gotcha. So what is, I hear the term nuclear used when talking about potato generations. What is a nuclear potato? Well, uh, it's nuclear as in the nuclear family. So um, potatoes are propagated um, uh, vegetatively in that, uh, you know, you, you grow corn, or you grow squash, you're using true seed. In the case of potatoes, it's more like garlic where you're vegetatively propagating it. So, um, Say if you've got a seed tuber, this is uh, one of our new varieties, Baltic Rose. Uh, this tuber weighs about seven ounces. If I were going to use that for seed, I would cut it into uh, four pieces, cut it lengthwise that way, and then cut it crossways to come up with a squarish piece. So what I'm after is a seed piece that weighs about one and a half ounces um, a piece. Uh, and that's kind of blocky in structure. So the four uh, plants that come from that, this would be a mother tuber, and the uh, daughter plants would all be genetically identical because it's from the same tuber, because it's vegetatively propagated. So uh, when they talk of uh, pre-nuclear, uh, when we are growing mini tubers from um, the potato plant, that's, that's called PN or pre-nuclear, and as soon as we plant it into the soil, that becomes nuclear production. And the, the industry is trying to uh, come up with a common no, nomenclature. Um, right now, each state um, has its own seed potato program. And there's about 10 or 12 states along the northern tier that raise seed potatoes. And they're trying to get voluntary compliance. So Maine used to have its system uh, first year in the soil was called nuclear one, second year nuclear two, third year nuclear three, fourth year nuclear uh, four, and then it would jump to G5 or generation five. So what they're trying to do now is to call 
the first year that is planted in the soil, call that FY1 for field year one. And it, it is a simpler to understand system. So the, the concept of nuclear is a little bit going uh, in, in terms of terminology in the industry, it's a little bit going by the wayside, but the reference for nuclear is like the nuclear family where it all comes from the same uh, parents. I got you. I got you. So you talked about cutting up the potatoes. Let's dig into a little bit of what I like to call potato growing myth busting. Cause in, in today's age where you've got all this content out there, like we produce, you read all kinds of different things about the best way to do things. So um, we'll kind of go through some of these first off chitting potatoes. Do you recommend planting potatoes with a little bit of a sprout on them or you just want to be able to see the eyes? Well, uh, at the very least, you want to see the eyes. Uh, that's what we recommend to our customers. The, the problem is, uh, first off, potatoes do need to go through a dormancy period before they'll sprout. And the dormancy period will vary depending on the variety. It'll depend on what type of a growing year it was where those seed tubers grew. Yet in a hot year, uh, they will sprout easier because they will be physiologically older. And that's something we can get into if you'd like. But um, uh, the, the bottom line is that um, you're better off to uh, allow at least the hint of a sprout coming out of the eye. That guarantees you that the tuber has broken dormancy. And what you don't want to do is plant a dormant tuber in cold soil and then it could be a day or two after you plant it, you get a lot of rain. And if that tuber is in cold soil, you may get invasive fungi that, that basically want to colonize that seed piece, um, take the nutrition from it. And we call, we human call, call that rot the seed down. But you're much better off if you don't plant until you see that sprout coming out of the eye. And we're big believers in chitting in this country. Uh, chitting is a European term. In this country, we call it green sprouting. Uh, but every year we green sprout uh, the seed that we use. It's 25 or 30,000 pounds of seed that we do. And uh, there's, you know, maybe your listeners know about green sprouting, but if not, there are two important steps. The first step is you warm up the seed at 70, 75 degrees in the dark to break dormancy. And that'll take anywhere from seven to 10 days, depending on the variety. Then once you see sprouts starting to emerge from the eyes, you wanna turn the lights on and you wanna drop the temperature back to 50 to 55 degrees. That'll slow down the respiration and keep the energy in the seed tuber. And it's important to to do that cooling step because you want the most vigorous seed because that vigor translates to the highest yields. And uh, if you do a full green, green sprouting procedure, it'll cut 10 to 14 days off the growth cycle in the field. And we begin, uh, we recommend uh, beginning a full um, green sprouting procedure about 30 days before your intended planting date. So in our case, we plant the middle of May middle of april is when we begin to uh, green sprout okay and and doing doing it by that procedure you just outlined there ensures when you put them in the ground they hit the ground running they, they're coming up pretty quick they come up quick uh that helps to shade out uh any weed competition that may be coming up and nature has given potatoes a tremendous ability to fight off rot as soon as that first leaf comes through the ground and the sunlight is hitting it, it, it empowers that uh, plant with a tremendous ability to fight off uh, fungal invasion. So what we recommend is planting relatively shallow, you know, two inches up here in Maine where it's cool, maybe four inches max down where you are in Georgia, uh, and then uh, trying to facilitate the quickest emergence. It cuts down your risk, um, but as soon as that plant comes through the soil, it really grows fast when you green sprout it. It's pretty impressive how quickly it can grow a crop. Good deal. Good deal. That's great information to have. As far as planting time, so down here, we always aim for about mid-February. Um, a lot of people always ask, well, the farmer, farmer's almanac says to plant this time, but I've always kind of aimed for two to three weeks before my average last frost date. 
what's your kind of mindset as far yeah. as when to plant? Yeah, I, I think definitely go by what the local old timers do. They they've learned this, the the microclimate in your area is going to be specific, and the old timers have figured it out. So uh, the way we go about it. We like the soil temperature to be a minimum of 50 degrees. And uh, here in Maine, again, we're six miles from the Canadian border. We're, we're way far up north. We struggle to get uh, soil temperature up. We don't. We have snow all winter long. It comes in November. It doesn't leave until the end of April. And then two weeks later, we're planting uh, in mid-May. So we're struggling to get up to that 50 degree uh, temperature mark. And the way that we measure soil temperature is that we have a soil thermometer and we place it uh, four inches deep and we check at seven o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and by doing that consistently, you're not getting an impact. If it's a warm, sunny day, you can get that thrown off. Uh, but by doing it seven o'clock in the morning, we're monitoring that soil temperature and, you know, it'll start out in the high 30s and then work its way through the 40s. and uh, we'll wait until it's going to be 50 degrees. If we're at 47 or 48 and the forecast is for three or four sunny days, we'll go ahead and start planting at that point. But by the same token, if it's uh, 48, 49 degrees and we've got a rainy week forecast, we'll hold up planting uh, because we don't want to have misses by putting uh, potatoes in that then get drowned out and, you know, uh, Oh, back 10 years ago, we were getting 10-inch um, uh, rain events up here in Maine, 2011, 2012, 2013. Uh, and that kind of um, extreme rain can really take a number on, on the germination. So you never have a crystal ball. Uh, so you want to do everything you can to minimize that risk. But uh, making sure that you're sprouting the seed ahead that's a real uh, advantage. And if you can go through a full green sprouting procedure, uh, so much the better. Good deal. Good deal. I'm going to have to go back and watch this um, in another month or so, so I can make sure and do that. So um, let's talk about planting whole potatoes versus planting cut potatoes, like you mentioned earlier. So we did a little experiment earlier this spring, planted a row, same variety of row of whole potatoes, and then cut up the seed potatoes. What we found was that the whole potatoes did produce more pounds yield per row length, but that if you factor in how much seed potatoes it took to plant those, that you were getting better value by cutting up the potatoes. What, what do you think about that? Well, they've done uh, studies and they found that um, if you have a, a one and a half ounce seed piece and to get it calibrated in your head, if you had a seed potato piece the size of a large hen's egg, that would weigh two and a half ounces. That one you'd cut in half. If it was any smaller, you'd leave it whole. And if it was bigger, you would try to cut that tuber up so you would have squarish pieces, blocky pieces that were approximately the size of half of a large hen's egg. So that would be an uh, ounce and a half. And if you go by ounce and a half, we figure you've got 10 seed pieces per pound. So they've done research on it and they found that there is no yield bump uh, when you go from one and a half ounce up to two and three quarter ounce. And above two and three quarter ounce, then you're getting a yield bump, but you're also using twice as much seed. Right. So uh, since there's no gain uh, from one and a half ounce up to two and three quarter ounce, we recommend to our customers that they plant a one and a half ounce seed piece. So uh, the ideal thing is to be able to buy seed that's small. And that's one thing that we specialize in. Um, one, the seed is small because our customers like it small. And, and if you had a hundred pound bag of large uh, tubers and a hundred pound bag of small tubers, that bag full of small tubers would plant more row feet than the larger tubers. So smaller seed is more valuable. And then if you look at it, this is a new variety, uh, Sharp Omira. But if you look at this, it's a moderate um, size seed piece. It's about the size of a large hen's egg. Uh, 
uh, in cutting this, I'd cut it in half to get two seed pieces out of it. But imagine if you had uh, this, you've got you know so many eyes over the surface. When you cut it in half, you're gonna have half as many eyes as that whole seed tuber had. So by having smaller seed, you're getting more eyes. Each eye becomes a stem on the plant. So there is a correlation between the number of stems per acre and the number of uh, tubers per acre. And the way to get the highest potential yield is to maximize the number of stems per acre so that you can uh, get a higher set. And then you have, basically you lay the foundation for the highest possible yields. So that's one reason that we do green sprout at a high temperature. By green sprouting at 75 degrees, you were, um, it's called, um, you were suppressing the apical dominance. If you sprout a seed potato at 40, 42 degrees, uh, the apical end, which is the dominant end opposite the stem, mm -hmm. that apical dominance, it's going to sprout. If you look at a, a potato, they are programmed by nature to reproduce themselves. All they care about is getting one or two tubers. Uh, we humans, we have a, a different agenda. We want to get as many tubers as we can. So by sprouting at 75 degrees, you are suppressing that apical dominance and you're giving energy to the secondary sprouts. So when done well, you're going to have a tuber that is loaded with sprouts. Uh, so whether it's a big seed piece that you're going to cut up or a small seed piece, uh, we like as many eyes as we can and that apical dominance, that will suppress the secondary uh, shoots from sprouting. So if you sprout at cold temperatures, and you know up here in Maine, <clears throat> uh, the, the farmers, they store their seed at 38 degrees all winter. They're often planting seed that's 42 degrees, uh, dead dormant, uh, hasn't broken dormancy yet. Uh, and our scale is a lot smaller and we're able to do some more finesse, and, and we found that it's worthwhile to warm that seed up, uh, maximize the number of stems per acre, maximize the uh, uh, set, and then that allows us to get a good yield without having to uh, sacrifice what we're getting for tonnage per acre, because we're after uh, as many small and medium-sized tubers as we can get, and one thing that we, like any seed producer, is going to do, we kill our crop down um, when they're relatively, when they're still in the juvenile stage, they're not fully uh, mature. And in that way, you're uh, you're killing the, you know, we, in our case, we burn the tops with propane flame, uh, but you're arresting the growth in the juvenile stage where that seed tuber has the most vigor in it, and vigor translates to high yield. So you're doing everything you can in growing that tuber. And then even from the time you harvest it, you get it into the potato storage, you superize it for two to three weeks, allow any wound that occurred during harvest to, uh, uh, to heal itself. Then we immediately drop the temperature down to 38 degrees and store it at that for the rest of the winter. And I had touched on this uh, physiological aging uh, it's an issue. This is getting into the uh, the weeds in, in terms of potato production and seed production. But uh, basically, uh, physiological age, young, physiologically young seed is full of vigor, and that's what you want. And um, if we have a hot summer, this year, say we had a hot summer, and then last year it was a cooler summer, the tubers that we harvest in the fall of that cooler summer will be physiologically younger. Basically, physiological aging is a um, uh, measuring of stress that, is, uh, that a tuber has gone through. So in a hot year, the tuber is undergoing stress. So, you know, the potatoes that you harvest, they're all going to be a little bit physiologically age, um, um, aged um, later. So if you can arrest that and cool them down quick in the fall, storm at 38 degrees, you can arrest that physiological aging and preserve the uh, the vigor that is going to result in a higher quality, higher yield crop the next generation. That makes sense. That makes sense. If that makes sense. It, it gets into into the weeds. Yeah, I, that makes and, sense. 
when, when we're sprouting, green sprouting at 75 degrees, we're speeding up that um, physiological aging because we want those secondary sprouts to sprout. And then when those sprouts sprout, then we cut the temperature back because we've achieved what we wanted. We want those secondary sprouts to sprout. Then we knock the temperature back to 50 to 55 degrees, slow the respiration down to keep the uh, um, uh, vigor in that seed. But, you know, uh, potato planting is relatively simple. It doesn't sound that way from our conversation. <laughs> yeah, but we're, this is this is what we do. Um, our county is uh, uh, was the number one potato producer in the United States as recently as the early nineteen early to mid nineteen fifties. Even before Idaho ever got its start, Maine was number one. Maine has been producing seed potatoes, certified seed potatoes for a hundred years. They've been growing potatoes for two hundred years, and we have we're gifted with one of the best um, opportunities in the world. Our soil is perfect, well-drained, sandy loam soil, perfect for growing potatoes. Uh, we never get that hot in the summer. We have minimal insect activity because it never gets that hot. We have very cold winters, which takes a high mortality on in insects. So we just have less insects than say down New York, Pennsylvania, anywhere south of us. So. We just have, between the soil and the climate, we have a perfect uh, ability to raise the highest quality seed in North America. Awesome. Awesome. Now, as far as planting the pieces of seed potato in the soil, you know, the old timers always tell us, put the put the eyes pointing up, you know, towards the sun. But I see videos of these commercial <laughs> farmers, people riding on the back of a tractor, and they're just chunking them in the furrow. Do you, do you care about orientation of the seed piece when you're planting? We, we don't. We're, we're putting in, you know, uh, 14, oh, probably 25 to 30,000 seed pieces per acre, and we put 10 or 12 acres in. So we're talking hundreds of thousands of seed pieces. In our case, you know, it, it, it adds two, two to three days to get that sprout to come up. That's a benefit if you're a backyard gardener and you can place it with the seed with the eye pointing up, you're going to do a better job than we can do. But on a big scale, it just, it's one of the trade-offs. You just can't turn it around. I yeah. see. I see. But so in the so, garden, so. if you're on a small scale, if you've got that ability to cut them up, place them with that eye pointing up and you'll get emergence uh, two days earlier. Okay. Awesome. Now let's shift into growing potatoes a little bit. This is another experiment we did this past year. We hear a lot of our viewers, a lot of people online talking about growing potatoes in straw or healing them with straw as opposed to healing them with soil. Now we may have not done this experiment perfectly, but we had pretty drastically different results as far as potatoes grown with straw around them as opposed to healing the plants traditionally with soil. What's your thoughts on the straw versus the soil? My thoughts are, you know, they can get more nutrients from the soil than they can the straw. Well, um, the method that I know um, was um, advanced in organic gardening. They wrote it up in Organic Gardening Magazine probably 50 years ago. And there was a uh, um, little bit of a independent, some might call her an eccentric gardener by the name of Ruth out. And this was called the roost out, no dig uh, potato method. And she would take the seed piece and plant it, uh, lay it right on top of the soil, and then add a foot of straw on top of that. So the roots would actually go into the soil. And potatoes are a fairly deep rooted plant. Uh, so I think in doing that, I think you're going to get all the um, uh, nutrition out of the soil that need the nutrition and moisture. Um, and then the beauty of that uh, straw is that it smothers out any weeds. They have no chance of growing. And then over the course of the year, the bottom layer of that is decomposing into the soil. So you're making a very nice, rich soil. We've done that in the home garden and uh, mulching with straw. Uh, just it's such a benefit for the soil going forward. The one caveat is that if you've got uh, field mice, uh, you have created heaven for them. 
They've got <laughs> cover under that straw. They've got a food supply. So if you don't have mice and can pull it off, I think it's a great, uh, uh, great method. But really, you're planting it on top of the soil, and then the roots are going down. So the beauty of this system, um, in the fall, you just peel back that straw, and your potatoes are laying um, on the soil. So it's the roost out, no dig method. You don't need to dig because the tubers are laying on the soil under the straw. So it's a brilliant um, technique, and I would definitely try it. But do be careful that if you've got the mice, they could uh, beat you to the harvest. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I don't think I, I gave that um, that method um, much service with my experiment. I'll probably need to revisit that. Um, one other thing we get asked about a lot, potato blooms. I read a study earlier this year, I think it was done somewhere in Africa, where they, it wasn't super significant, but they did find that they got a little better yields by picking off the blooms. Why do potatoes sometimes bloom and they sometimes don't bloom? And is there any benefit to removing the blooms on a small scale? Yeah, uh, I'm not aware that there's any benefit. I mean, if there's research going on that's indicating the benefit, um, great. I would, it, it's hard to imagine it would do that much difference, but different varieties uh, blossom. Um, some blossom prolifically. Um, the variety, one of the heirloom varieties we have is all blue. It's got blue skin and blue flesh, and it has the prettiest blossom that you've ever seen. It's got a beautiful lavender blossom, and to see a whole field of all blue is, is something. The green foliage and the lavender, it's, it's something. Um, but then a variety like Yukon Gold, Rarely, we might, you know, in a one acre plot of Yukon gold, we might have a couple of dozen blossoms in a normal year. Um, one year we had a lot of blossoms uh, and that was just blew me away. We had more blossoms that year than all the other years combined. And we've been growing Yukon gold for 35 years. Uh, but it it um, is, again, because you're vegetatively propagating these potatoes, they don't have to bloom. Um, they're in, uh, potatoes are in the nightshade family, same as tomatoes. Well, that blossom, two months later, that becomes a tomato. With potatoes, God, I think, just put those blossoms there for us to enjoy. So not every variety drops, uh, gives us blossoms. Um, they don't, you don't have to have blossoms. We had one year, this is maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, we always look forward to the blossoms because it's so beautiful to see the fields. And up here, we've got uh, 50,000 acres of potatoes. And to see them, you know, some of the blossoms are white, some are pink, some are uh, lavender. It's really um, a special time of year up here in mid-July. In fact, they have the main potato blossom festival to celebrate that. And people come from quite a distance just to see that. Um, but one year, we were expecting um, uh, uh, a beautiful bloom, and then we got uh, an insect came in, and it cut off every one of those blossoms. We never had any blossoms that year. We had a good crop, but it was kind of a disappointment that uh, that we didn't have any blossoms come through. And they had chewed on the very top leaves and took the blossom, didn't affect the crop, had a good crop, but we didn't have blossoms. So you don't have to have blossoms to get a good crop, varies by variety. When you do see the blossoms, that's an indication that you've got tubers underneath that are probably about ping pong ball size. So we use that as a way to kind of, you know, monitor how the crop is coming and, and where we are in, in terms of the growing season. And from that point onward is uh, the stage is what they call uh, tuber sizing or tuber bulking. And from that point on is when you, you want to make sure that the uh, potato crop has adequate moisture, either from natural rain or from irrigation, because potatoes are, you know, 90% water, and if they're denied water, their tubers aren't going to size up properly. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. One more thing as far as growing potatoes. Now, you mentioned, correct me if I'm wrong here, so with yours, you kill them off with a, a propane torch, so you have those smaller seed potatoes that have more vigor in them. For the home gardener, we're trying to maximize our harvest. You recommend, and I've done this 
several different ways over the years. You recommend waiting to the plants die completely back or start showing a little bit of death. Is there a lot of growth between that kind of initial yellowing until they completely lay on the ground? Yeah, um, I guess it depends on what your goal is. If if you want to um, raise, you know, um, uh, several hundred pounds of potatoes to feed the family through the winter, then you're going to be concerned about maximizing the storage capability. So in that case, you want to let those tops die down completely before you go to harvest. But if you're going to harvest short term, or if you're just going to grow enough to have a few feeds during the, the uh, gardening season, uh, when you do it really doesn't matter. Um, you can eat a potato any time you want from the time they're marble size on up. In terms of practicality, you probably want to let them get at least golf ball size to make it worth your while to get a yield. But um, you can let those tubers grow up. And, and one benefit from gardening uh, that a gardener can do that we can't do is once the potatoes are sizing up, you can kind of paw into that hill and you can feel around and you can pluck out tubers that have grown large and leave the rest of the tubers to continue to grow and size up. We can't do that. We've got to, you know, treat everything, um, uh, you know, kill them all at once and, and take what we get. But um, if you're going to store for any length of time, you're best off to let that top completely die. And while the top is green, even when it's yellowed, it is sizing up. If you've got moisture, if you've got adequate fertility, you were still getting sizing. And one old timer here in Aroostook County, um, the, the crop um, was harvested into cedar potato barrels, 12-pack uh, barrels that held 165 pounds of potatoes. And uh, Aroostook County pioneered this system, and they had barrel trucks that would pick up the barrels and the barrels you could roll. Uh, and I know where my dad grew up on an uh, apple farm in Yakima, Washington, they grew a couple of acres of potatoes and they'd do everything in burlap bags, meaning that you'd have to lug that bag, you'd have to lift it onto the truck, you'd have to lift it off the truck. So the barrel system really uh, was uh, a great advance and um, the Farmers up here would measure everything in terms of barrels. You need, you know, seed growers would plant 20 barrels of seed an acre, 3,000 pounds of seed. Uh, you'd harvest, you know, 125 to 150 barrels an acre was a good yield that they were after. Uh, so they would always um, uh, look at what rate those tubers were uh, growing to determine when they wanted to kill down the crop so that they could plan to start harvesting two weeks after. But uh, one old timer was telling me that when, ev when the conditions are right in the fall, uh, where you've got adequate moisture, you've got adequate fertility left, and you don't have uh, um, excess pressure from pests, that you could get an increase of five barrels per day uh, on the size of a tuber. So if you go, if you figure that out in a seven day week, that's 35 barrels a week. Uh, and this is probably on a like a late season russet variety that really sizes a lot, but uh, it's an indication of how much that crop is growing. So uh, I wouldn't, um, you know, if you're out for the biggest yield, and most of us are, uh, let the crop grow as long as as is feasible. You know, if you got a rain coming, you might want to, you know, take that crop in before the rain. If you've got a frost coming. Uh, to where the frost can penetrate the hill, get in, you know, maybe down in Georgia, you guys don't worry about things like that. <laughs> Up here in Maine, we worry about that. You know, when, when you're in early October and you're getting into the mid-20s mid and you can get frost penetrating that hill, uh, you can run into a whole lot of mess by having potatoes that freeze. Then once they thaw out and they break down, so... Uh, you know, most probably four out of five years, we can harvest our crop without any frost damage. But sometimes, you know, the weather is just crazy and you can get some cold weather. Usually it's into October. So we, we try to get done in September to avoid frost damage. But uh, 
uh, down where you are, maybe it would be more a factor in a fall crop like this uh, cold weather. So, so supposed to be coming through, you know, it, it sounds like it's really, you know, once a, in a generation kind of a cold that's coming. So if you've got a hills of potatoes that are kind of sticking up and you could get penetration by the frost, be a good time to maybe harvest those potatoes before that cold came. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, man, those are some awesome, awesome potato growing tips. We're going to um, stop this portion of the interview right here, and then we'll jump into part two, which we'll have on the next video. And we're going to get into some um, growing rotation practices, some things you can do with growing potatoes to kind of reduce your input as far as spraying for pests and stuff, but then also talk about some of your varieties that you have. So thank you, Jim. You bet, Travis. All right, so that was part one. Hopefully you learned something. I know I did learn a lot of things from that conversation with Jim. And if you did learn something new, please share that with me in the comments below. And don't forget, if you want to try out some of Jim's seed potatoes, the website is woodprairie.com, and you can use the code LazyDogFarm to get 5% off. Coming on the next video, we'll have part two. In part two, we're going to dig into this whole biofumigation thing using mustard as a biofumigant prior to planting your potatoes, how that has worked for Jim over the years. And then we're going to talk specifically about some of his varieties he has, what are the best tasting varieties he has, what are the easiest to grow varieties, and what are the highest yielding varieties. So if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh.